Over the last two years, I've made various videos using music theory to analyse the works of the Beatles. And every time I do this, I inevitably get loads of comments saying the Beatles didn't know any music theory. But at the same time, many argued the opposite, that the Beatles had a mastery of music theory. For example, composer Howard Goodall describes Paul McCartney as a composer who really knows what he's doing. Now, whether or not it's actually relevant if the composer did or didn't know music theory when you're analysing a piece of music is a completely different question. The thing I want to look at today is how true is that statement? Did the Beatles know music theory? Over the last few weeks, I've been looking at countless interviews, biographies, and even live footage of the band playing to try and get a better idea of how much theory the Beatles really knew. Let's start by addressing the fact that the Beatles didn't know how to read or write sheet music. I don't read music or write music. None of us did in the Beatles. We did some good stuff though but none of it was written down by us. It's basically notation. That's the bit I can't do, because I don't see music like that. So the Beatles didn't read or write sheet music, so surely they didn't understand music theory. Well, no. Reading sheet music is only part of what it means to understand music theory. Even if you don't write your music down as traditional sheet music, music theory can still be at the core of how you learn, write, arrange and perform music. So, what did and didn't the Beatles know about theory? Well, let's start with some of the most basic concepts of music theory. For example, did the Beatles know how to count beats and bars? Well, one piece of evidence that may help us answer this question is the way that Paul counts in All My Loving. Why did Paul count 1, 2, 3, 4, 1? and not just one, two, three, four. Well, it's because the Beatles knew that All My Loving begins on the third beat of the bar. So to count it in, Paul can't just say one, two, three, four. Instead, he has to count a whole bar and then the first beat of the next bar. This makes sure that the whole band are on the same page rhythmically when the song begins. And this isn't just the case for All My Loving. Any time the Beatles count a song in, they take into consideration what beat the song begins on. Also, in interviews, the Beatles often talk about their music in terms of beats and bars. When the Beatles were recording A Day in the Life, they were yet to come up with an idea for the 24-bar section in the middle. They decided to temporarily fill the gap with a 24-bar count. We'll count it, we'll just do our song and we'll leave 24 bars. So the Beatles were aware of bars and beats. But what about something slightly more advanced? What about time signatures? Did the Beatles know about time signatures? Well, the Beatles may not have called them by their proper names, like 4-4 four, four, or 3-4, but they had their own ways of describing how many beats were in the bar. For example, on We Can Work It Out, the middle eight section shifts from 4-4 four, four to a 3-4 fill. And there's no time And although Paul doesn't describe this as 3-4 or triplets, he does describe it as waltz time. Then it was George Harrison's idea to put the middle eight into waltz time, like a German waltz. When it comes to more advanced time signatures though, it seems that whereas a trained musician might count out the beats in a bar closely to make sure they stayed in time, Ringo at least had to rely instead on feel and intuition. For example, Here Comes the Sun features many different time signatures, but as you can see from this interview, Ringo preferred to feel the timing rather than to count it out. He comes in to me because he'd been to India again, I think. He said, oh, I've got this song, it's like seven and a half time. Yeah, so, you know, he might as well have talked to me in Arabic, you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, and that's how I come off, I had to find some way uh, that I could physically do it and do it every time, so it came off on the time. I had no way of going, yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I stopped my brain. So as long as I go, okay, that's seven, good, got it. So we've looked at rhythm, but how much did the Beatles know about chords? 
Well, it seems pretty evident that George, Paul and John all knew the standard major, minor and seven chords on guitar. It appears that they gained their education in guitar chords from various sources in their childhood. For example, Paul tells this great story about how they travelled across Liverpool on a bus just to learn about the chord B7. In fact, you know, sometimes we'd travel the whole of Liverpool just to go to someone who knew a chord we didn't know. Um, remember once hearing about a bloke who knew B7. Now we knew E and we knew A. It was quite easy, but we didn't knew B7. We didn't know B7. That was kind of the missing part of the link, the other chord, the lost chord. So on we got on the bus, trooped across Liverpool, changed a couple of buses, found this fella, and he showed us dum, 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 B7. We learned it off him. Got back on the bus, went home to our mates, and went. Zing! Got it. George Harrison perhaps had the best knowledge of guitar chords. After all, John claimed that they asked George to join the band because he knew more chords than we knew. In this quote, George describes when he discovered how inversions work. I remember discovering inversions. Suddenly I realised how all the shapes transform up the neck, all with the same chords inverted higher and higher. But what about some slightly more advanced chords, like 6, 9 and 11? She Loves You ends with a G6 chord, sang between the vocal harmonies. Yeah, 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 yeah. Paul has described this G6 as that tight little sixth cluster we had at the end. This is quite a sophisticated description, as Paul has not only correctly identified that this is a sixth chord, but he's also aware that because the fifth and the sixth of the chord are voiced only a tone away from each other, that they create what can be called a tone cluster. One of the most iconic chords of the Beatles catalogue is this one. The best way to name this chord has been debated for years, but when George Harrison was asked in 2001 what he was playing for this chord, he said, F with a G on the top string, but you'll have to ask Paul about the bass note to get the proper story. This quote is quite revealing for two reasons. Firstly, the chord that George is playing is an F add 9 chord, but it seems that George didn't know that this chord is called F add 9, instead describing it as an F with a G on top. But secondly, this quote from George shows that he's aware that regardless of what chord he's playing on his guitar, that the bass note that Paul is playing is going to change the quality of that chord. In the case of this chord from Hard Day's Night, when Paul plays this D below George's F add 9, the chord that is sounding between them is now a D minor 11, even though neither instrument is actually playing a D minor. This is quite an advanced concept for George to be aware of, so even if he didn't know how to name the chord F add 9, he is aware of the more important idea that the bass note can change the nature and therefore the name of the chords he's playing. Paul also seems to be aware of this concept. For example, in an interview with David Leaf in 1990, Paul describes how he noticed that on the Beach Boys' pet sounds, the bass would often play more than just the root note of the chord. The thing that really made me sit up and take notice was the bass lines. You just get a completely different effect if you play a G when the band is playing C. There's a kind of tension created. One of the musical elements that the Beatles' music is best known for is key changes. But did the Beatles actually know that their music was changing key? Well, various sources seem to indicate that the Beatles at least had an awareness of key. For example, look at this quote from Paul describing how he wrote here, there and everywhere. I sat out by the pool with my guitar and started strumming in E and soon had a few chords. We can see from this quote that Paul has an awareness that chords can belong in a key together and that if you write a song using these chords together, your song will be in that key. McCartney in particular seems to have a good grip on this concept. When he described the writing process of Michelle, he said it started as an instrumental in C. And likewise, when asked how the Beatles constructed the Abbey Road medley, Paul described the challenge of fitting the different segments together due to the fact that they were in different keys. However, although it does appear that Paul McCartney was aware that his songs were in a key, he perhaps wasn't as aware of when they were changing key. From Me To You was one of the first Beatles songs to feature a key change. During the middle eight, the music briefly modulates away from C major to F major. 
it's the G minor and the C here that are creating the 2-5 perfect cadence that's modulating us to F. Although Paul doesn't describe this as changing key, he knew that this G minor and this C were taking us to somewhere new harmonically. That middle eight was a real big departure for us. Say you're in C and then you go to A minor, fairly ordinary. C, change it to G, and then F, pretty ordinary. But then it goes, I've got arms, and that's a G minor. Going to a G minor and a C takes you to a whole new world. It was exciting. In this quote, Paul is literally just describing the way that he's changed key from C to F. The only thing he doesn't do is actually use the term changing key. And this seems to be a common thread across the Beatles' understanding of music theory. They often seem to have an awareness of these concepts, but they just don't use the standardised terms to describe what's going on, perhaps due to a lack of formal education in music. It seems George Harrison was perhaps more aware of when songs were changing key. For example, in this quote, George is describing the challenge of fitting Indian instrumentation onto a song like Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, due to the fact that Lucy in the Sky modulates. That wouldn't work on a Western song like Lucy, which has chord changes and modulations. What about something more advanced, like modes? I've actually made a video before about how the Beatles songs use modes, but were the Beatles themselves actually aware that they were using these modes at the time? I'll Get You, which was the B-side of She Loves You, features a brief bit of Mixolydian modal interchange. In other words, this A minor chord briefly shifts us to the Mixolydian mode. Paul may not have been aware that this chord change was Mixolydian, but he certainly knew that something was happening here beyond the standard major scale. It's like D that goes to A minor, which is unusual. You'd normally go from D to A major. It's a change that had always fascinated me, so I put it in. I'm not saying that this is evidence that Paul McCartney understands modes, but this does show that Paul knew that this chord change introduced something different and interesting to the tonality of the song, and although he didn't have a name for it, he could hear the modal interchange at play. It appears, out of the four Beatles, it was perhaps Paul McCartney who had the best knowledge of music theory. McCartney was seemingly aware of many basic music theory concepts and terms, such as scales, semitones, and arpeggios. When discussing how he wrote Lady Madonna, Paul describes his left hand as playing an arpeggio with the chord. And when discussing the riff at the beginning of Please Please Me, which climbs down the major scale, Paul refers to it as the scaled riff at the beginning. As many have noted before me, somebody who had a big role in turning the Beatles' ideas into musical reality was their producer, George Martin. George Martin was well versed in music theory, having studied at Guildhall School of Music, and his knowledge and skills often served to plug the gaps in the Beatles' own musical knowledge. Any time that outside musicians were brought in to record on a Beatles song, like string players or horn players, it would be the job of George Martin to transcribe the Beatles' ideas into sheet music which could then be given to the musicians. Yesterday was the first Beatles tune to include a string quartet. To capture Paul McCartney's ideas for what the strings should do, Paul sat at the piano with George Martin and worked out what he would like. George Martin would often show Paul the traditional or typical way to write for the strings, and Paul would often push against these ideas. I remember suggesting the seventh that appears on the cello. George said, you definitely wouldn't have that in there. That would be very unstring quartet. I said, well, whack it in, George. I've got to have it. George Martin would often use his knowledge of music theory to refine the Beatles' ideas. For example, Can't Buy Me Love originally just launched straight into the verse section. However, George Martin felt that it needed an intro. He suggested using part of the chorus, but adapting the chords so they lead into the verse after only six bars instead of eight bars. I thought that we really needed a tag for the song's ending, and a tag for the beginning, a kind of intro. So I took the first few lines of the chorus and changed the ending, and said, let's just have these lines, and by altering the end of the second phrase, we can get back into the verse pretty quickly. And they said, that's not a bad idea, we'll do it that way. The Beatles seemingly picked up various bits of musical knowledge from their time working with George Martin. 
For example, in this clip, Paul describes how George Martin suggested increasing the tempo of Please Please Me, but the Beatles weren't actually sure what tempo meant. George Martin said, can we uh, change the tempo? We said, what's that? He said, do it faster. Oh, oh. well, we don't, he said, let me, let me try it, please. First night he said, he said, it's good. Oh, he said, oh, it's all right, yeah, it's all right, not bad. A bit embarrassed that he'd found a better tempo than we had. In this interview with John, he describes George Martin's role as a musical advisor. He had a very great musical knowledge and background so he could translate for us and suggest a lot of things which well we'd be saying well can we well they go Ooh, and, and, e, e, and he'd say well look chaps i thought of this this afternoon last night i was thinking i was talking to uh, whoever he was talking and i came up with this you know and we'd say oh great yeah. great or <laughs> put it on here you know yeah i mean he taught us a lot and i'm sure we taught him a lot by our, our sort of primitive musical ability which is all I have still you know I still have to have something to translate what I'm trying to say all the time so looking at all of this evidence what can we conclude how much music theory did the Beatles know well John summed it up quite well in that last clip when he said you know, I still have to have something to translate what I'm trying to say all the time one of music theory's best uses is as a language a set of terms and concepts that let musicians communicate with each other about what they're hearing. And it was this aspect of music theory that the Beatles seemed to lack. The band certainly had a basic understanding of the fundamental ideas of music theory, key, chords, rhythm, but they lacked confidence with the correct terms and descriptions for the different musical concepts they were hearing, meaning that they couldn't use music theory as a language. This is why George Martin was the perfect galvanizer for the Beatles. He could be the one to translate what the Beatles wanted to hear from their music, meaning that they were never held back by what they did or didn't know about music theory. And going back to something that I touched on at the beginning, many people claim that because the Beatles didn't know theory in great depth, that analysing their music using theory is arbitrary and is looking for meaning which isn't there, looking for intent that wasn't there. But that's missing the point of why we analyse songs. One of the many things that music theory is useful for is as a set of tools to look under the hood in our favourite songs. If you want to get an idea of what makes your favourite Beatles song sound the way it does and why your music doesn't sound like that, the best way to do that is to look at the chords they used, look at the tonality, look at the rhythm, look at the time signature. They're the sort of things that will give you the ideas that will make your music sound closer to their music. I've heard time and time again that music theory is just a set of rules or music theory limits creativity, but this couldn't be further from the truth. And if you think like that, then you probably haven't been taught theory in a very constructive way. Even if you don't realise it, if you don't know music theory and don't know how to use it, then your songwriting and your musicianship is probably stuck in a box. You're probably playing the same old chords in the same old way all the time. And every song you write is probably just a variation on the same four chords. But if you can know how to break out of that, how to know what chords you're using and how you could vary them, if you can learn how to change the time signature you're using or change the mode, then it opens up a whole world of possibilities. And by no means do you have to do it the right way. There is no right way. That's not what music theory is about. Music theory is just a way of describing what is there to be used. And a massive thank you as always goes to everybody who supports me on Patreon. You really do make all of the difference, particularly during these difficult times. And I hope you don't mind, but I thought today, instead of me reading out the shout outs, that we could listen to this bit of Beatle banter that I found during my research. <laughs> That's wrong. Oh, I'm so sorry. I feel so stupid. I don't know what to do. Gosh. Look, uh, Terence. What if you it? wanted to resign from the amateur dramatics, do. It's not that. I put a lot of money and thought into the whole thing. Yeah, but let's face it, you're crap. <laughs> aren't you? Well, all right, all right. I Maybe mean, you're only doing walk-ons. Whose father was he got the hall in the first place, eh? Yes, yeah, so you're only doing walk-ons and you're farting those up. Now. Oh, Christ, you're Give it a kiss. Ha! Yeah, I'm okay, down. let's take it from the through. top and run it. Don't take it from the top. I mean... The yes, okay. Mm. But let's run it from there, then. From there. Here it comes. Ooh. Lots of 
And you got time to rectify. Mm. <laughs> and you got time to rectify all the things that you should. That was that it. You should. You should have got me that boy. I was moving. Until I'd known him to get back in here, you know, he's kind of grooving out of the.